MRI is about a $6 billion a year industry. So it's not a trivial application of superconductors at all, but the biggest critic of superconductors is that it is actually the only application. So what I want to do tonight is try to convince you that that actually is not the case, and there are a number of other potential applications. But there's quite a story to tell here, um, and what I'd like to do is begin by acknowledging my research group, a number of them are here today. Uh, so we have Hua Shi, um, and she's done most of the materials development work that I'm going to be talking about this evening. Uh, but I've got, as you can see, an army of other people here. I'd also like to point out John Durrell, who looks after characterization in my group, Mark Ainsley modeling, and then Archie Campbell, uh, who's emeritus professor who describes himself as a postdoc in my group. And he sits with the, st sits with the students every day, and what an asset he is. And here they all are, and there's Archie hiding at the back um, for some reason, and was here. Okay, so here's this overview of my presentation. I'm going to talk about the background, and there's quite a background to talk about. Uh, I'll talk about the main properties of bulk superconductors, recent developments, and then really get to the nub of what I want to say, which is to talk about other applications, and then to summarize at the end. So I guess the story begins in 1911 with the Dutch physicist Kameling Honours. And there was a battle between Kameling Honours and Lord Kelvin, and the battle was who could liquefy helium first. And Kameling Honours won with spectacular results, as you'll see. <clears throat> Superconductivity is now observed in more than 20 metal elements and more than 1,000 alloys and compounds. It really is an extraordinary property of materials. And it's produced 12 Nobel Prize winners. And I don't think there's any subject in any discipline that even comes close to providing 12 Nobel Prize winners. And that kind of tells you about the excitement and the challenge that goes with the subject. So here's Kameling Honours looking very grand in his uh, laboratory in Leiden. And here's the plot. It's uh, the resistivity of mercury versus temperature. And down it trundles this nice linear slope. And there were various uh, predictions about what happened at lower temperatures. So some people thought it just kind of continued to decrease linearly. Others thought the uh, resistance leveled off. Well, that's quite insightful, some kind of limited uh, lattice vibration mediated scattering, which gives you this fundamental res resistance. Lord Kelvin, for some reason, predicted that it would increase again. No nobody quite understood why he predicted that, but he did. Nobody, however, predicted that the resistance would disappear completely. And at 4.2 Kelvin, um, this resistance vanishes. And you can measure resistance by inducing a current to flow by applying a magnetic field and then monitoring the magnetic field. And one experiment, again in Holland, um, took a superconducting loop of material, created this magnetic field and monitored it for seven years without any decay. So this really is a zero resistance state. It's extraordinary. Uh, well, I said Kameling Honours discovered this. Uh, some people say it was Kameling Honours and student. And here's the student, Gilles Holst, uh, and the student chose to remain anonymous. Uh, but the story goes that uh, Kameling Honours had just liquefied helium, and he sent the student away to do this measurement of, very straightforward measurement of the resistance of mercury versus temperature, and the student came back with this extraordinary plot. So Kameling Honours took one look at the data and said, that's outrageous, it's non-physical, you know, go away and redo the experiment. So the student went away and redid the experiment and came back with exactly the same data. And that gave Kameling Honours a bit of a problem. Um, either the student was completely incompetent, couldn't do a very simple measurement, <clears throat> in which case he had to be taken off the project, or it would be one of the most important discoveries of the 20th century and could lead to the Nobel Prize, in which case the student had to be taken off the project. <laughs> <laughs> so poor old Gilles Holtz barely gets a mention. Um, so what are the general properties of superconductors? Uh, well, first of all, there's no measurable flow, uh, no measurable resistance to the flow of current below a well-defined temperature. It absolutely goes away. If it's AC current, there is some resistance, but DC current completely goes away. That means you can potentially generate very large currents without any energy loss in the medium that you're generating the current. Superconductors behave as perfect diamagnets. So if you approach with a North Pole, a superconductor will become a North Pole, and we'll be demonstrating that a little later on. 
And that means you can potentially generate very big magnetic fields. If this current flows without limit, that's not true, but getting on without limit, and field is generated by current, then large fields give you large currents. Uh, one point at the bottom here is that to get a really big magnetic field, you want a current flowing on a very large length scale. So that tells us straight away that big samples carrying large currents is the thing you want to generate large magnetic fields. So the bigger the sample, the bigger the current, the bigger the field. Um, so here's a bit of uh, GCSC physics. Uh, it's uh, Faraday's law. And Faraday's law says that if you expose a conductor to a changing magnetic field, d phi by dt here, uh, then you induce a voltage. And that voltage causes a current to flow. And that current will generate a magnetic field that opposes the change that's causing it. That's Lenz's law. And that's signified by this minus sign here. So flux changes, we induce an EMF in the conductor. Current flows, we generate the field. And the field we generate opposes the change that's causing it. So if you take a piece of copper, you approach it with a magnetic field, uh, you induce a current, it decays away after a few milliseconds, the copper warms up a little bit, but you don't notice. In a superconductor, what's going to happen is we're going to induce that field, so we're going to induce that current, and it won't decay away, so the field that it produces will persist. And essentially, that res results in the resistance, of, um, resistance to motion of the conductor in a changing magnetic field, or into some very spectacular levitation effects when we start looking at superconductors. Uh, so I don't want to dwell on this plot for too long, but... This tells us that superconductors are diamagnetic. This is the minus bit of the Lenz-Faraday equation. So here we're applying a magnetic field on the horizontal axis to our superconductor, and our superconductor is becoming magnetic. It's exhibiting a magnetization, and that's in such a sign, such a way to oppose the change that's causing it. And if there are no DMAG effects, then this angle's 45 degrees. So if we apply half a Tesla, our superconductor generates minus half a Tesla. So that means since flux has a beginning and an end, uh, our external field is in this direction, our internal field is in equal and opposite to our external field, which means the field in the superconductor is zero. So one peculiar property of a superconductor is that it will expel magnetic flux from its interior. It's called the Meissner effect. And materials that collapse at some well-defined field here are called type 1. Type 1 superconductors are pretty useless for applications. Fortunately, there's a second type, type 2, and rather than superconductivity collapsing at a well-defined field, it gently goes away. And this upper critical field here that superconductivity disappears at can now be more than 200 tesla. And we'll talk about fields and their size uh, a bit later on. Uh, but what happens at this point is that rather than the superconductor keep all the field out of its interior, the uh, field starts to penetrate the interior of the material. So for this region here, which we call the mixed state, there's, uh, re there are regions in the superconductor that contain no magnetic flux and regions that do contain magnetic flux. And it's within this mixed state that we can potentially generate very large currents and very large fields. Um, OK, so just to summarize the magnetic properties of superconductors, uh, in some way they're easier to understand than normal conductors because there's no resistance. But eddy currents flow on the surface of the superconductor to maintain this zero internal field below some critical field. Above that field, BC1, field starts to penetrate the superconductor. Uh, eddy currents are induced by the applied magnetic field, so a changing field gives us these currents. Uh, and both surface currents and currents within the bulk of the material contribute to the magnetic properties of the superconductor. OK, well, let's go back again to uh, actually primary school, I think, now. So we're regressing steadily here. Uh, so this is a bar magnet, and this is an experiment that uh, most children have done. You take a bar magnet, you put a white piece of paper over it, and you sprinkle iron filings, and that's what you get. Um, Faraday called these his lines of force. Faraday was very proud of his lines of force. And what Faraday said was that if a free North Pole existed, which it doesn't, but if it did... Um, and you released it anywhere in space, it would uh, be attracted to the South Pole, but it would follow one of these force lines. Uh, the problem with this is that children see this diagram and they think magnetic flux forms these discrete lines in space, uh, when actually it doesn't. What's happening here is one magnetic 
uh, iron filing is landing, that's being magnetised, that's then attracting another one to it. So if you repeated the experiment, you'd get lines again, but they'd be different lines. Uh, in free space, magnetic field is actually a continuous variable. It's like increasing the velocity of a car or the speed of a car. It doesn't increase in stages, it increases continuously and smoothly. Um, however, in a superconductor, lines of flux do exist. It's extraordinary. So here we have um, a superconductor actually produced in Oslo. And as soon as flux enters a superconductor, it becomes quantized. It actually forms thin filaments of magnetic flux. And you can see them schematically here threading through the material. And you can actually see these uh, lines of flux. You can decorate your sample uh, with something that's magnetic and offers contrast under some microscopy. And that's exactly what's happened here. We apply the magnetic field, it penetrates the superconductor, you decorate it with something magnetic and you see this beautiful array of individual dots. Each dot is a flux line looking through the, the material. And you can even see we get this nice hexagonal pattern here, which tends to tell us that the magnetic flux lines are free to interact with one another. There's nothing stopping the motion of these flux lines. Uh, so if you're a physicist and you want a nice pure material with no obstacles in there, so you get this free movement of magnetic flux, this is what you want to see. If you're an engineer, you want to get the field in and you want the field to stay. So you want to pin the magnetic field in there. You want to hold it in its place. Uh, and the last thing you want to see is this nice uniform distribution. You want to see a gradient of field. And again, I'll come back to that. Uh, interestingly, physicists call this type of behavior ideal behavior. From an engineering point of view, it's far from ideal. Uh, so again, this is a fairly schematic. Um, if we now have a material carrying a current, so here's our superconductor with all its flux lines in there, and we're passing a current from left to right. We've got a magnetic field that's vertically oriented. Here we've got a cross product, and that just conserves the orthogonality or the 90 degree relationship between the variables. So J is at right angles to B. J cross B gives us a force on the flux lines, and that is at right angles to both J and B. So if we've got a B here, a J there, then we try to sweep the magnetic field lines through the material. If these are free to move, we've got a D5 by DT again, a change in flux. Therefore, we've got an EMF. An EMF gives us a loss. Our material gets warm. If we're trying to keep it cold, then it becomes unstable. So we need to pin these magnetic flux lines. We need to put something in the material that stops these field lines moving. And if you get it right, um, then you can produce a material that, that traps because you force the field in and it can't escape. It's trapped in there. If you get these flux lines right, the flux pinning's right, pinning right, and you get this beautiful, we call it a bean cone. Uh, so this is a magnetic field distribution of a superconducting sample. And this one's showing a peak field of about one tesla. But you see this beautiful um, flux cross-sectional area. Um, so what I want to do now is to um, try and demonstrate, uh, to bring to life some of the things I've been saying. So a typical superconductor looks like this. It's just a pellet, basically. Um, some people call these hockey pucks. I don't really like that term, but as my research group knows, but uh, these are hockey pucks. And these have got a transition temperature of um, about 92 Kelvin. Uh, and the significance there is that we can use liquid nitrogen to cool them um, because liquid nitrogen has a, uh, a boiling point of about 77 Kelvin. So if we cool these down, so as they go through their superconducting transition, they go from a normal state to a superconducting state. And I've got a fairly simple magnet here. It consists of three magnets. North pole up, then an annular magnet around it, south pole up, then a final annular magnet with north pole up. So if you look at the cross section of the field, it does this, it dips in the middle. And what I'm going to do when one of these materials is cold, I'm going to bring it down to the surface of the superconductor. We're going to get this equal and opposite magnetic field induced. And I'm not going to force flux into it, but I'm just going to let it sit in this magnetic cusp. And it'll sit there nice and stably. And if I try to displace it, it will just simply fall off because we're in a state where flux isn't actually penetrating the material. So there's quite a, a significant thermal mass here, so it takes a few seconds to cool down, but we're getting there. Um, the second experiment that I'm going to do af after that is I'm going to do the same thing again, but I'm going to force the superconductor down onto the surface of the magnet. So I'm going to make flux go into the, the superconducting material. I'm going to do work on the material to achieve that. But when flux is in, it's hard to get in, 
it wants to stay in. And you'll see we get a very different system. So the second system I demonstrate, the superconductor and the magnet will become a single system regardless of the fact that there's no contact. So I think it's easier to demonstrate than to describe. So here's uh, the first part of the demonstration. So there's the superconductor, kind of just sits on the magnet. If these were two uh, permanent magnets, there'd be an instability. The top magnet would flip over and north would track south. But you can see that's pretty straightforward there. But if I move it to one side, it just falls off. There's nothing keeping it there. So the next experiment is to do exactly the same thing, uh, but to force field into the superconductor. And what I'm demonstrating here is the effectiveness of pinning centers. So you get flux in, it wants to stay there, and unless I apply a big force, the superconductor and the permanent magnet will form one system. So I'm forcing flux into the superconductor, so it's levitating again, but now I've got a single system, so I can even turn the thing upside down. So, so it's energetically stable, and what's actually happening in the superconductor is that it has a choice. It can allow flux to move and therefore generate internal energy, and therefore its entire energy state goes up, or it can keep the magnet where it is and not have to cope with this internal redistribution of flux and current, and its net energy state remains low. And anything in, in, in physics or nature will adjust itself to give itself its, its lowest possible energy. Uh, so one other demonstration now is I've got a bar magnet here, and if the superconductor sees a uniform magnetic field, the field doesn't change, then d5 by dt is zero, and it's very happy, there's no energy implication. If you try to change the field, it will resist it, just as it did in the previous experiment. So here, as long as the superconductor moves along the bar, it's going to be happy, but when it gets to the end, uh, you might want to think what's going to happen, or if it tries to move to one side. So we'll put it on this bar. This is my uh, mini magnetic rail, okay? If you multiply this by 100,000, then you get an idea of a real working system. So you see the superconductor, there's no... And you can even, again, turn that on its side. So one particular application here would be to have a, a lift on a magnetic track that you could put outside a building. You could actually make it fail safe, though, because if the superconductor warmed up, it would fall off. But if you put it on a rail around the building, then you could actually do that. I've seen a mock-up of this, and you can dial in any room on the periphery on a building, and the lift will take you directly to it, and there's no contact between the superconductor and the building. Okay, so the final thing I want to demonstrate is suspension. And previously, I've actually forced magnetic field into the superconductor, so I've used uh, mechanical work to do that. Now what I'm going to do is cool the superconductor down in the presence of a large magnetic field. So here's a fairly big permanent magnet. So here's my specially designed cryostat. Uh, and if I take the superconductor and put it in here, so there's nothing happening now because it's above its transition temperature. Um, and what I'm going to do is cool it down in the presence of the magnetic field. So what I'm using now is temperature to pin magnetic flux in there because the field lines will be frozen in when this becomes superconducting uh, and to see where it gets us. So, so there's a, a slight issue in that um, polystyrene is not the greatest uh, load-bearing material that I've come across. And now <clears throat> these two should be a single system. So I ought to be able to pick this up, which I can. Uh, but now I've got to try and separate it. So sometimes this is a bit tricky to do because the forces are pretty big. Okay, so now I've taken the field from the magnet. I've done work on it, so we're not getting anything for nothing. And now I ought to be able to reconnect the two and we should have a stable system. Okay, so that'll suspend away. Uh, until the superconductor warms up. So it's not just levitation, it's suspension that can work as well. If I just move this to one end, then you might be able to see a bit more. You've got to be very careful when you uh, do things with strong permanent magnets. Uh, uh, I gave a lecture at the University of Manchester one year, and I caught a, 
a train from a station in Derbyshire. And I sat outside, this my family here, they can testify to this. So I sat outside the, on, on this metal bench and the train pulled in. So I stood up to get on the train and my bag refused to come with me. <laughs> so this train's full, I had to stand on the bench and kick the magnet off. And you could see when I, when I got on the train, people were moving over so I couldn't <laughs> sit next to them. <laughs> Okay, so uh, let me say a bit about the theory of superconductivity. Um, this isn't particularly helpful from an engineer's point of view. We believe the materials superconduct and we design with them. Uh, property of superconductivity is really something for the physicists, but uh, what's actually happening, and it took until 1957, from 1911, almost 50 years to have a credible theory, is that uh, rather than electrons in the material that carry the current repelling one another, they find an environment in which they can attract. It's extraordinary. It's a real quantum mechanical description. I'll try and describe it in real space in a moment. Um, but two pairs, or a pair of um, half-spin entities, we call bosons. And bosons um, are described by different statistics and individual electrons. <clears throat> and a whole bunch of things can happen if that's the case. And this pair of electrons is called a Cooper pair. And Cooper received, surprise, surprise, the Nobel Prize. Um, and they actually couple up by having opposite spins, uh, but otherwise identical energies. And uh, essentially what's happening is that if you take a very specialized lattice of charged particles, positively charged, and you put an electron in the vicinity, you get a contraction of the positively charged lattice around the first electron. And then a second electron, rather than seeing the first electron, sees the buildup of charge around it and is therefore attracted to it. So via some complex interaction with this very specialized lattice, electron two, electron two is attracted to electron one. And it's this coupling that reduces the energy uh, and therefore will happen if it's possible. Um, it, this is actually called, the contraction of the lattice is called a, a, a phonon. Uh, and obviously, if you go to high temperatures, these lattice ions are vibrating around all over the place, and any small contraction can't be seen, which is why superconductivity is traditionally uh, a low temperature phenomenon. If you type Cooper pairs in on the internet, this is what you get. Uh, it's a print by Alison Cooper, and there are two pairs, and I gave this talk at a school once, and... Uh, a young woman came up to me at the end and she said, this picture, everybody knows that's not true. And I said, why? She said, because one of these would be upside down if it were a real Cooper pair. Uh, so let me just summarize on BCS theory. It's a weak interaction between two electrons. And if we can make them attract, they will. It's obviously sensitive to the number of electrons. So if you've got lots of electrons, electron-electron repulsion will dominate. And we had a very special lattice there as well. So we require a material with a low electron density. So if you take a material, you measure its conductivity at room temperature and it's too high, the chances are it won't superconduct, or in fact, it definitely won't superconduct. Uh, and you want a low dimensional lattice. So that kind of predicts really the kind of thing you should be looking at. Uh, so all superconductors behave, all known superconductors behave as poor metals at room temperature. So here's a thing, especially for young people in the audience, uh, this theory is called BCS theory. Bardeen, Cooper, Schrieffer all won the Nobel Prize for this. And it makes a very definite prediction. The best theories make experimentally uh, validatable predictions. And this predicts the TC. And there are three variables here. Uh, theta d is the Debye frequency. It's the frequency with which the lattice can move, understandable. U is the energy gain that, or energy loss that the superconductors can undergo by moving into the superconducting state. D epsilon f is the density of states. These electrons have to condense into available energy states. And if you maximize, if you take each of these variables, theta d u and d epsilon f, and you take the maximum values that's known for any material, regardless of whether it's superconducting, that gives you the maximum Tc. And that comes out to be 28 Kelvin. So BCS uh, was extremely successful predicted the behavior of literally hundreds of materials. And then when niobium germinate was discovered in 1975, TC of getting on for 28 Kelvin, you can guess what happened. Everybody stopped looking for superconductors because BCS 
was so successful. Well, I say so successful, there was one compound and only one compound, this barium-lead bismuthate, discovered in 1976, uh, and BCS theory uniquely couldn't explain its properties using this simple equation. So what do you think the academic community did with this inconvenient result? It completely ignored it, okay? So, we have a lesson for life here, and uh, let me illustrate this with a quote. And the quote is, a design weight of greater than 1.1 pounds per horsepower will never be achieved using a gas turbine or jet engine. Propeller-driven engines are the only practical option for long-term aircraft propulsion. And that was uh, an unattributed statement but in 1940 by a representative of the US aeronautical industry, apparently following an exhaustive study of propulsion. Frank Whittle commented subsequently, <laughs> Fortunately, I was too stupid to know. So the point is, you can never prove a theory. All you can do is disprove a theory. No matter how successful, there may be that one observation that disproves the theory. Um, and in 1986, this remarkable paper appeared. Everybody had given up the hunt for superconductors uh, by Bednotz and Muller working for IBM in Zurich. And a number of comments about this paper First of all, it's called possible high temperature superconductivity. Who begins a paper with the word possible? It's not screaming confidence, is it? Uh, and the second thing, it's in Zeitschrift für Physik B. I wonder how many people have even heard of Zeitschrift für Physik B. It's kind of not really the, the journal that you choose if you wanted worldwide circulation. But it reports a barium lanthanum copper oxide system that shows a large change in resistivity at around about 36 Kelvin. Um, and it turned out, if you look at the periodic table, that if you take lanthanum, barium, copper and oxide, oxygen, and you just move from lanthanum to yttrium, so it's the same group, so you just move up one, that's all you do, you find you have a material with a TC of 92 Kelvin. It's extraordinary. Bednotz and Muller won the Nobel Prize in 1987 for this work. Uh, but now this BCS limit of 28 Kelvin is looking a little bit tame. Uh, and subsequent materials, there's a bismuth-based material, uh, again 90 Kelvin, up as high as 105 Kelvin, a thallium-based material, 120 Kelvin, and the current world record is a mercury-based material of 166 Kelvin. It's minus 107 centigrade, uh, it's not the warmest, but compared to the BCS of 28 Kelvin, it's extremely high. I've got a colleague uh, at the University of Helsinki, and he claims that 107 degrees is getting on for room temperature on some days. Uh, so people say, are oh, we going to have room temperature superconductivity? My friend Seppo would say we have it already. Uh, there are one or two problems with these materials, though. And that is that although these uh, temperatures are above that of the boiling point of liquid nitrogen, uh, they tend to be ceramic materials. They're in sintered form, they have grain boundaries, and grain boundaries are not very good for carrying current, so you need to get rid of those grain boundaries. So things like lots of grain boundaries, you might get small current loops, but you need a big sample carrying a big current. Uh, the BISCO materials tend not to be granular, but are very sensitive to applied field, not so good if you're trying to generate a field. Uh, YBCO, yttrium barium copper oxide, the rare earth barium copper oxides uh, are more granular but are not sensitive to the applied field. Uh, so it turns out the candidate materials for generating high fields, and these are fields compared to the field you can do with permanent magnets, are yttrium barium copper oxide, samarium barium copper oxide, and adinium barium copper oxide. And there's a, a relatively new material based on gadolinium that shows even more potential. But YBCO, Ironically, the first material to be discovered with a TC above the boiling point of liquid nitrogen really shows the greatest short-term potential for applications. But you've got to be able to make it grain boundary free. This material here, you see this thing still levitating, it's suspending, is yttrium barium copper oxide. So how do you go about making it grain boundary free? And you can see the logo here of the bulk superconductivity group. You can see this single uh, grain material. These fourfold facet lines tell you it's a single grain and we've got a seed crystal that we're growing it from at the center. And there's this very convenient peritectic reaction that occurs at about 1,000 degrees C. So our solid, one, two, three, so rare earth, one, barium, two, copper, three, that's the superconducting phase. 
That breaks down into a second solid phase, non-superconducting, 211, rare earth 2, barium 1, copper 1, and the residual balance of the cations and oxygen are, it forms a liquid phase. And essentially what you do is you just reverse this reaction, uh, you parse the decomposing material, you add a structurally compatible seed, and then you cool it back down slowly. You nucleate and grow at the position of this seed. And conveniently, we can substitute yttrium for samarium, samarium barium copperoxide. It's chemically compatible, but it's got a higher decomposition temperature. So we don't melt the seed, but we partially melt the material. So schematically, this is what's happening. Uh, here's our superconductor. We've got a hot end and a cold end. So this is probably at about 1,005 degrees. We put a seed at one end. The hot end that's decomposed, the white background is liquid. Uh, the circles are our second solid 2-1-1 phase. Two things are happening here. Um, we need the rare earth iron or yttrium to grow our 1-2-3 phase. So at the growth front, we're dissolving our 2-1-1 phase. And that's happening at a certain rate. And we're growing at a certain rate from right to left. So we've nucleated at the seed. The growth front's moving this way. If we're growing at a greater rate than we're dissolving, then we leave the 2-1-1 phase behind. So eventually we run out of rare earth iron and the thing stops growing. So we've got this very neat trick where we enrich our material with additional 2-1-1 before we start to grow. And that means we can grow bigger samples uh, and we can grow uh, for longer because we've got more solid there to mop up the liquid. So that's how we make single grain materials. If you look at the microstructure, um, I don't know if you can see, but there are these discrete second phase inclusions, uh, and between them we've got this continuous superconducting phase. Uh, and these second phase inclusions are going to be very good for flux pinning. Um, if you get it right, this is the kind of sample you take, you make. So these are things of beauty. Uh, I'm amazed that they haven't found a market in jewellery. Um, but every time I see one of these very spectacular large single grains, the elegance of the process isn't lost on me. The record size is 13 centimetres nippon steel, single grain 13 centimetres diameter. Um, we can correlate ability to carry current with the volume fraction of these second phase materials, which indicates that flux pinning is strong. Um, but it may be that these 2 on one inclusions are not the best way of pinning magnetic flux. So I'm not going to dwell too long on this, but I just briefly want to mention three key materials developments. And the first thing is a generic seed. Um, if you look at the materials that are lanthanum barium copper oxide, neodymium barium copper oxide, samarium barium copper oxide, the light rare earths, they tend to give you the better properties. But their decomposition temperatures are high. So it's okay if we want to grow yttrium barium copper oxide, we can use samarium barium copper oxide to seed it. But what if you want to grow samarium barium copper oxide? What seed do you use? Well, for a long time we used magnesia, and lattice mismatch was very big, gave us fairly poor properties. Um, but actually, Huar, as part of her PhD, developed a new generic seed, magnesium-doped neodymium barium copper oxide, and you get this big leap in decomposition temperature, 20 degrees. And we can use this seed now to grow any one of these materials. And as soon as you develop something like this, the first thing you do is you give it to another group to reproduce. Because if other groups can't reproduce it, then it doesn't have credibility. And not only did other groups reproduce it, um, they reused seeds we gave them. Um, so this then uh, avoids the need, for example, for hot seeding. The Japanese, when they grow near barium copper oxide, which they grow extremely well, I have to say, and we can't reproduce what they do, but the samples are extraordinarily good, is they often open a furnace at very high temperature and they deliver a seed crystal one millimetre by one millimetre at the end of a rod which is a metre and a half long right to the centre of a, a partially molten material. If you get it right you get very good results but it's not really industrially compatible. So now all our seeding is at room temperature. Um, We've also developed a new flux pin finning phase. We call it the 2411 phase. So in this case, it's yttrium, barium, four, copper, one, tantalum. And you can replace the tantalum with almost anything. Um, and if you get this right, you get this very fine distribution of second phase materials. And if you look at the bottom left picture, this is a big old 211 particle. And you can see these tiny white dots in between. And they're much more close to the dimensions of the flux lines and much more efficient 
at pinning magnetic flux and 211. So you can use 211 to grow the material and you use this 241 phase to pin flux. Uh, we can also batch process, so if you want a large number of these samples at a medium scale, we can do that as well. Okay, so here are some fields. Um, the Earth mag Earth's magnetic field is about 0.1 of a millitesla, pretty small. Uh, a solenoid, so you, you wind a, a coil in the laboratory. If you're lucky, you can get to about 0.1 of a tesla. A permanent magnet, the best you can do practically is about 1.5 tesla. That's iron, but you have to make it in the form of a long, thin rod. That's how the Victorians used to make their magnet. Samarium, cobalt, neodymium, boron, iron is around about 0.8 tesla. Uh, low temperature superconducting wire-wound MRI magnets, you can get up to 5 tesla. Industry standard's about three, it's coming down to one tesla, but if you go back up to seven tesla, you get better resolution. Uh, oh, by the way, I like this one at the bottom, explosive flux compression. Um, you get your uh, permanent magnets, you pack them around your experiment, you pack TNT around it, and I used to say, then you press the button, but sorry students, you get your student to press the button, uh, and for a very short fraction of a time, you can generate fields of up to 2,000 500 tesla. For some reason the research councils are not too keen on these kind of proposals. Um, so progress in the field has been pretty rapid. So back in 1992 this very famous group in Japan produced this picture. So clearly it's a goldfish. Uh, so it's levitated above a bulk superconductor. Uh, the whole uh, arrangement has a mass of about two kilograms. Four years later um, they produced this. So this is an array of bulk superconductors. Uh, and this is uh, Tosunomi, the 1996 World Sumo Wrestling Champion. Uh, nicely levitated, there's a two centimetre gap there. The whole arrangement is 200 kilograms. This was filmed at a place called uh, Sapporo in uh, northern Japan. And I was at this conference and I spoke to Tosunomi. This is an absolutely true story. And I said to Tosunomi, you know, these superconductors are good. He said, yes, Jap Japan makes the best superconductors in the world. I thought I might argue with him, but then I thought, no, I better not. <laughs> so the other thing that these two have in common, apart from being levitated, is that neither of them look very happy, do they? Um, but Murakami, who built this platform, told me that um, a couple got married, uh, the first ever couple in the history of the planet, apparently, to be mar married on a levitating stage, and they paid $7,000. So this was the first commercial application of high-temperature superconductors. <laughs> So we, we have our own platform now, so it's available for weddings and other things. <laughs> um, okay, so to put the field into context, the thing that we're interested in magnetic pressure goes as field squared. So the bigger you can do, there's an increasing return. So field squared is a thing that we're interested in. Uh, magnetic pressure and energy are both measured in, in the same units. Um, so if you can go to three tesla between two bulk superconductors, then the kind of pressure you'd get would be the pressure you'd experience in a gas cylinder. If you could go to 50 teslas, then that would be an energy density equivalent to TNT. Um, that's a serious field. Uh, there's a, a documented case of a technician in the US. He got his finger caught between two neodymium boron iron magnets coming together, 0.8 tesla, and it took the end of his finger off. So, you know, 10 tesla compared to that is 100 times the energy density. So straight away we get into the regime of having very large fields. So what about record fields? Well, until recently, the highest field ever was 17 tesla, which is 10 times the field you can generate with iron, 100 times the energy density, 400 times the energy density of something like a fridge magnet. You know, a colossal amount of energy in there uh, at 29 kelvin. The sample looked horrible, but that's not the point. The point is... You know, who cares what it looks like if you're generating a field like that? Uh, it had a wood's metal down the middle so heat could uh, uh, leak out. It was backfilled with epoxy for secondary reinforcement, and it was even wound ultimately in uh, CFRP to strengthen the material. Um, so this is 13 years ago. It's a, a groundbreaking paper. That this was, you know, this redefined the height of the highest mountain that scientists were trying to climb. Uh, so. We've been saying for a long time that we've got the best samples in the world. Um, so the question is, can our bulk superconductors do better? Um, and it's, this is an experiment we did in collaboration with Florida State University in Boeing, uh, the National High Field Magnet Facility. Um, 
where insanely large fields are available? And the answer is uh, our samples can. So we produced this paper in July. The, the trap field is 17.6 Tesla, and so it beat the old uh, record by more than half a Tesla in a gadolinium barium copper oxide sample. But the point about this is it's a standard sample. You, you make it, you just uh, take a, a steel band, you heat the steel band, you drop it on your sample, and off you go. No specialist machining, no um, specialist um, reinforcement, no um, thermal management of the sample. Um, so, um, that was a new record, um, and this was the arrangement. We took two samples, we put them in a, a steel container, uh, we re reinforce the thing with a steel band and then you cool the whole thing slowly in. You apply your magnetic field, then you remove the magnetic field. Um, and here are the results. Um, so if you look, we've got a, a whole set of hall probes across the sample to measure field. If you look at the one in the centre, we apply the field, we remove the field and measure how much field is left. And you can see here we have, this is our record field, at the centre of the sample when we have no applied field. Um, it's got a massive energy density, and it's about 12% of the energy, energy density of TNT. Um, so when we do this experiment, quite often we put one sample in there, and the forces are so big, you get 3,000 samples out. But you know that's happened because you've heard it. Uh, if we now allow the sample just to warm up, at 50 Kelvin, it's still trapping 10 Tesla. 50 Kelvin is a temperature you can uh, achieve using a thermoelectric method. So something you plug into the wall will generate 50 Kelvin. So it's, uh, I would argue it's a, a technologically accessible temperature that avoids the needs for liquid cryogens. Uh, and this just shows you the field distribution at low temperature. And you can see this is flattening out. So if you extrapolate this, uh, you find that it should go up to about 22 Tesla. And right now, John Durrell uh, with the student, Jordan Rush, is over at the National Highfield Magnet Laboratory, trying to beat our own record. Um, so when Rebecca said phones should be quiet at the beginning, I thought, it's a pain, but I'll turn it off. So he might be trying to ring me right now. <laughs> um, so bog standard samples, uh, the kind of samples that Wall can churn out, um, what do they trap? Well, at 50 Kelvin, it's about seven Tesla. Remember, the field we're competing with has got an energy density of about a 50th of this. So that gives you an idea of how practical it is to make materials routinely that can generate fields that are huge compared to the fields available. Okay, so I've got to share this with you. Um, so uh, we got quite a lot of media attention when we reported this. Uh, virtually everybody wanted to know about these samples. So I spent a lot of time on the phone explaining, and it's very difficult, you know, the significance, what the materials are. And then um, one journalist pushed me, and she said, but how much material is there? So it's a pellet, it's you know, 11 millimetres thick, it's 2.4 centimetres diameter, you know, pi r squared times, no, no, how much material is there? So it's actually about the same amount of material as you'd get in a golf ball. Uh, so all of a sudden, our superconductor became a golf ball sized magnet. Well, you can just about live with that, but then journalists speak to each other, and before we'd know, we knew it, it actually became a golf ball. <laughs> And a journalist rang me up and said, what about this levitating golf ball then? So, uh, and I said, yeah, they're amazing. You have a magnetic tee and there's no mechanical contact and off you go. Okay, so I just want to finish off by really answering the question that I posed at the beginning and that's to talk about other applications. So the first application, quite obviously, is maglev. So this is low loss, it's stable. Uh, None of the demonstrations I gave you tonight has got any active control. There's no electrical input whatsoever. It's completely passive uh, and it's stable, as you can see, as other magnets, permanent magnets aren't. So maglev is a good well. And here's uh, the first maglev car uh, carriage. Um, it's at the Southwest Jiatong University in China. This has carried over 40,000 passengers, a total distance of around 500 kilometers. The track length? Four meters. <laughs> uh, but you see, you can, it can carry getting on for a ton, uh, and there's a huge lateral resistance, so it's very stable. Uh, and again, no, the only energy input here is to keep the superconductors cold, and they're located actually in the carriage. Um, there's a cryostat that's been designed, and here it is. 
and this cryostat's got bulk superconductors in here, and it's cooled with liquid nitrogen. Here's our magnetic rail, and you cool it in the presence of a magnetic field, just as I've done here. So if you were to turn this whole thing upside down, apart from spilling liquid nitrogen everywhere, you get the principle. And this demonstration shows you just how stable this whole system is. So you see, laterally, it's got a complete degree of freedom, only air resistance won't change. I hate it when that happens, but it keeps the audience awake. <laughs> so you can see this is completely stable, and there's a, a very good healthy gap there too. Uh, so the challenge then is to try to remove this um, using brute force. Um, and apparently it's trying. <laughs> so I think they believe him. So you can see it's completely stable uh, to motion. Uh, so this fell off, of course, because liquid, nit uh, liquid nitrogen had gone. So this material is not superconducting at all now. So there's no interaction with the magnets. So that's the only reason it fell, because it warmed up. Um, flywheel energy storage is another good potential application. Um, so Boeing have a device. So this is a, a flywheel. Um, it's a, a fiberglass-wound flywheel. And by putting your energy into a flywheel, you can do things like load leveling. I'll say something about that in a moment. But you want to avoid mechanical losses, so you don't want a mechanical bearing. So we provided, I think it was about 64 samples. We made this uh, superconducting plate array. There's a magnetic imprint in the bottom here, and the whole thing just sits above uh, our superconductors, and the thing spins around. And the advantage there is that if you take batteries, you can store the energy but you can't get the power out. If you take uh, flywheels with mechanical bearings, then you get this rapid decay in energy. If you use a superconducting bearing, no mechanical contact, you get the retention of a battery, but you get the ability to take power out. And you can do this for load leveling. If you think about how power stations operate, where you have these huge variations in demand for power from virtually none at all in the evenings, in the night time, to a huge amount when it's uh, uh, half time in the cup final. And our power stations have to sit there in a suboptimal position in terms of their output, just waiting to meet the demand. And there's legislation uh, which says that they have to respond by a certain amount. It's much better to have power stations that are despecified but with a, uh, a constant output and in periods of um, under demand you store it periods of over demand, you subsidize it. And things like uh, underground systems are moving towards flywheel energy storage. Uh, motors and generators, uh, the force or the torque is a product of two fields. If you can go to bigger fields, then you can go to smaller devices for the same torque. Smaller and lighter devices, there are parts in the UK that you physically can't deliver a large machine to. It's impossible to get it to that particular place. So you could revolutionise that. Um, so again, uh, if you just were to save 0.1% in efficiency, that would be uh, if, um, cost savings of hundreds of millions of pounds potentially uh, just in the UK alone. Uh, there are things like medical device applications. So again, you have to think out the box because these are new applications. <clears throat> but uh, one particular application, again, being worked on in Japan, is that you use this very sharp focus field to help you deliver drugs. So if you've got a drug that's got a magnetic character, uh, rather than saturate the body with the whole drug, which gives unwanted side effects quite often, you use the tip of this field to localize uh, the drug within the human body, then you remove the field. So you only release the drug at the point that you want to treat. So this has got huge benefits in reducing side effects, Quite often there are bits of the body that you can't operate on, so if you could actually treat it locally using this technique, that would be a big breakthrough. Uh, so again, surgery is difficult, it's a good technique, and if it's an obstinate disease, then you can focus the treatment where it's needed. Um, and here's uh, the first MRI scan. This is a mouse embryo <laughs> taken using a bulk high temperature superconductor, so 77 Kelvin. Uh, all right, it doesn't have the image quality that you'd expect of uh, Mr. Beckham's knee when he gets a twinge in it and uh, he goes to the top of the queue. But you can actually pick out the key organs of this mouse embryo. 
So imagine one of these in a doctor's surgery, probably £70,000 you could correct, produce one for rather than the two or three million for full systems. You could do a pre-diagnosis here and decide whether it's cartilage, whether it's muscular, whether it's a tendon issue, and whether the patient should go for a full-scale MRI. So one of these in every doctor's surgery, I think, would revolutionise diagnosis. And the final application uh, is something that you don't necessarily predict. <clears throat> Now, this should be a video, but it's not working. I apologize for that. But uh, the schematic on the left, the light green are, are bulk superconductors. So you've got one, two, three. You arrange them in two planes of magnets. One re resists motion in one direction. The other resists motion in the other. And if this were working, you'd see this base plate is vibrating violently. So is this one, but the top plate is absolutely static. And uh, there's a suggested use for this device, operating theatres in earthquake zones, where you can stabilise the patient completely. Um, I just worry about the surgeon, though. What's happening to the surgeon when he or she is doing the experiment? Uh, so, so new applications that probably we wouldn't have considered before. OK, so after all that, let me summarise. Um, I think, well, I hope I've convinced you that books, high temperature superconductivity is a very exciting and challenging area of research. Uh, I personally feel very fortunate that I was in the right place at the right time. Serendipity certainly smiled on me. Um, and it's been an extraordinary journey seeing the development of these materials over the past 30 years. Uh, bulk superconductors have considerable potential for a number of permanent magnet-like applications, not just MRI. There have been significant developments over recent years and a whole bunch of applications are currently emerging. Uh, for a long time I've been saying over the next five years, uh, I actually now hand on heart believe it. I think over the next five years we're going to see some real applications of these devices and two that we're working on um, with a company in Hong Kong in the medical area are extremely exciting and we're getting quite close to, to coming up with something that can do the job. So with that, thank you for attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you.